Uh, we have introduction. My name is Jim Plank. I'm a retired Air Force uh, physician, so please don't hold that against me. Uh, internal medicine and uh, flight medicine. I um, have uh, been on CCAT teams and done critical care with that. And then I also, um, for many years, ran the International Health Specialist Program for the Air Force um, before the, I retired, which is about 50 pounds ago. And um, so um, I'm, uh, that's kind of my background. I do work uh, at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences as a professor in their global health um, programs there and I run a couple different courses there. But my um, full-time jobs are actually in travel and tropical medicine. So way more about me than you probably wanted to know. Um, but uh, just a little background for uh, why they had me uh, maybe come and, and speak with us. Um, because I'm actually not really employed by the USU, so they don't pay me, I just work there. Um, these uh, views are all mine and have nothing to do with the Department of Defense. So one of the things I just wanted to kind of highlight from the beginning um, is that the, just what is global health engagement? And I know we talked about this yesterday some, um, but it's a very confusing term for many people. It's confusing because those who don't have a military upbringing look at global health as the public health, um, um, for, from the public health perspective, where we're actually working on developing um, systems and processes that improve the overall health of a population, whereas global health engagement has that as a secondary objective, but our primary objectives are different. And you can kind of see from this definition that our, our primary objectives are to coordinate mutual activities, maintain influence, achieve interoperability that support our end objectives. And so that confusing you know, term global health in there is there. That's actually why the Air Force, back when they stood up the International Health Specialist Program, chose to call them International Health uh, Specialist and not Global Health Specialist was to potentially um, avoid that, that confusion. Um, and so the, um, the name has changed over time. So it, it ultimately um, has ended at global health engagement, but at one point it was called um, medical civil military operations, um, which is still so, uh, a term used in some of the publications um, and certainly applies more specifically to your Army um, civil affairs community now. Um, and then it went to becoming medical stability operations and ultimately um, about five or six years ago ended up um, doing the formal transition to um, being referred to as global health engagement. So a little bit about the history of that. So we do global health engagement um, not because we're trying to improve the um, uh, global health um, uh, landscape for the entire globe, but to achieve national security uh, objectives in military end states. And I think that's something in our messaging with our partners that we need to try to weave in there um, whenever we can. Um, and so, you know, what is that difference? The difference has basically to do with the fact that we use global health engagement um, not as a uh, medical tool, but as a security cooperation tool. Um, and security cooperation, you guys have probably seen these kind of definitions here, have a lot to do with how we um, interface, excuse me, if I go back, interface with um, many of the other instruments of power, um, the diplomatic, the uh, informational, and the economic. And so um, security cooperation uh, is not a unique to the Department of Defense, even though sometimes when we see the, the Department of Defense Security Cooperation Agency, it, it kind of has that connotation. We use security cooperation across the spectrum of government operations. Um, global health engagement, where does that fit in there? It fits in the entire range of military operations. And this is from the Joint Pub um, on, on Joint Operations. So it ranges from military engagements and security cooperation and deterrence through limit contingencies and crises up to large scale combats. And you can see a couple of different examples where global health engagement has been used in those activities over the course of the last little bit. And I think most of you are, are really familiar with that, so we won't belabor that any further. I'm gonna go through these pretty quick, but um, global health and the use of medical um, assets to support our commanders is not new. 
It started back in the Philippines in the late 1800s. We did it in World War I, we did it in World War II, we did it in Vietnam, we did it um, in um, Korea. Um, we ultimately, in the late 90s, started kind of saying, okay, we've been doing this for you know, close to 100 years now. Um, we should actually start to maybe institutionalize this a little bit and look at ways to actually develop some doctrine and guidance that support it rather than it being a pickup game. Unfortunately, as many of you know from your lives, it's still a pickup game a lot of, a lot of the time and not necessarily as indoctrinated or as uh, defined as it should be. Um, but a couple things that have happened that have provided a little structure to that are listed here. Um, the uh, Center for Disaster and Humanitarian Assistance Medicine was the first organizational um, um, uh, alignment, if you will, that had this as a primary responsibility. That um, ultimately ended up morphing or changing into the uh, Center for Global Health Engagement several years back. Um, the Air Force in the late 2000, 2000, 2001, began the International Health Specialist Program, and they were the first organization to develop any um, type of uh, doctrinal um, guidance. So there's an Air Force instruction on international health that came out in 2001, and that was the first time any of the services or the joint community had put anything on paper uh, about this being a mission set. Um, and then um, the Defense Institute for Medical Operations um, that you're going to hear from later stood up in 2002 and it was a com combination of an Air Force organization called the Institute for Global Health and a Navy institution that taught out of, um, out of the Monterey School and they combined to make um, a, 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 both a, a Navy Air Force organization which ultimately became um, uh, primarily Air Force now. Air Force is the lead agent on that. Um, from a publication standpoint, the first pub that kind of really got to this was not a medical pub, but it was the stability operations um, document that came out in 2005, kind of in the aftermath of our initial forays into, um, into the Middle East, where we had done our large-scale our large combat operations, but now we were worried about how do we maintain stability after having um, gone in there and, um, and, and had a change in government in many cases and, and definitely having a change in the landscape. Um, that actually led to us uh, back up in the D.C. area doing an assessment of what, what are the military capabilities that we have from a medical perspective that could support stability operations. Some of that led to um, the doctrine that you now see in the uh, Joint Pub 4-02, the Health Services Support Document, um, where there's a whole section on medical, civil, military operations, and that, well, that kind of all generated out of that assessment. Um, the OSD stood up an International Health Division, which actually still remains, but instead of being a handful of people, it's down to either one or two people with an occasional contractor who supports them, and so they no longer really support you uh, and or the combatant commands. They um, pretty much support the um, Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and um, have the lead on developing um, policy up at the uh, up in Washington. Um, you guys um, are, um, you know, part of an organization when you're supporting or supporting part of an organization, AFRICOM, that actually was the first COCOM to have a global health engagement team in it. So the others had a couple of people in them intermittently. Sometimes they were there, sometimes they weren't. But the first team that had a dedicated global health team was actually um, Africa Command when it stood up in 2008. And that's changed its composure and its composition um, over years, but it remains a, a, a linchpin in their, in their operations there. The first medical um, uh, uh, doctrinal guard, um, um, joint medical doctrinal uh, document was the medical stability operations in 2010. Um, and that, uh, that was followed by um, uh, some policy from the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy that actually was a little more specific. That was the first time that they started to integrate the words uh, global health then instead of uh, using the words stability operations. So 2016, Center for GHE established and um, they helped to lead another assessment um, and there's a, uh, an ongoing um, capability assessment that's been um, pub it's recently published that um, we're still trying to meet the objectives of, even though 
we've told Congress we've met them. There's still several of those objectives that have yet to be completed you know, uh, in total. So anyways, that's, that's kind of the history of it. Um, and not, to, you know, not because I wanted to belabor you with, with history so much, but just to kind of let you know that when we step into something, we sometimes don't understand the history of where people have been. And it's not necessarily a bad idea to kind of understand how we got uh, here from, from where we were you know, 10 or 15 years ago, which is why they had an old guy come talk to you um, instead, of, uh, instead of a new guy. Um, so this DOD 2000.30 um, is the um, instruction on global health engagement and still active. Um, the, um, it has several different things and it, 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 I don't know, is this actually focused for you guys? Could be, could be my eyes, I'm close, so you know. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll blame it on, on, on my eyes. Um, but it has um, a diagram in it that is very difficult to read sometimes um, um, because of the colors in it. But it lists just a ton of different types of activities that all kind of fit into that spectrum of what is global health engagement. And, um, and so I think when you look at that, yesterday we had several questions about what is medical security cooperation versus what is global health engagement. And I guess it depends on, on the side of the fence you're standing on. If you're, if you're a security cooperation um, uh, community member, um, whether you're a SCO or whatever you are, then you'll look at it and say, well, that's medical security cooperation. Um, but if you're on the other end of the fence and you're actually a global health engagement person, you're like, well, it is medical security cooperation, but it's also a, a global health engagement. And so I think sometimes we um, can get caught up in the definitions and not necessarily realize that um, it's okay to have two different ways to describe an activity as long as we, are, we understand the objectives of that activity and, and, what's, and, and what it means. The other document that I did put on here is Joint Pub 4-02, and there's a reason for that. So when I submitted these slides on the 23rd of August, um, the Joint Pub 4 2 had two mentions of the word global health in it. That was it. Um, and Joint Pub 4-2 is the, is the doctrinal guidance for health services. Um, um, on the 29th, they released the updated um, Joint Pub 4 2 you can't get it online yet, unfortunately. Um, my email's at the front, and if you send me an email, I can, I'll definitely forward you a copy of it because it's been published. It just hasn't um, replaced the old one online yet. Um, and it does have information on global health. It, it, it includes global health engagement as a part of joint staff surgeons' offices. It includes um, having global health um, uh, be a separate health support mission, uh, health service support mission. Um, it ends up having um, uh, two paragraphs on it. One of those paragraphs has to do with just what is global health engagement. So it's kind of a variation off of the, the 2003 definition here that kind of just goes over the big thing. But then the second paragraph is interesting, especially in light of some of our discussions yesterday and what we do in our medrexes. And that is that the second paragraph discusses the attempt to minimize or the need to try to minimize the amount of direct patient care that we're involved in. And so the genesis behind that has to do with the old fashioned way of doing um, medical readiness training exercises and medical civil action programs where we went in unilaterally without the host nation, provided services, and then, and then left, and oftentimes left behind unintended consequences, whether that was displacing our uh, our partner nation medics, or whether that was having patients that needed follow-up that we hadn't arranged properly for, whatever the case may be. And so the, that section has to do with that. It also kind of highlights, um, for me, one of the things that when, when um, yesterday when we were talking about strategic communication, one of the things I think that we often fail at as uh, security, as, as global health engagement um, personnel is messaging appropriately for our leaders. So, um, so it is important that they understand those good stories that come out of this, and, that, and it really catches their eyes. But it's equally important to make sure that they understand that the reason we were there wasn't to provide that service. Our reason for being there was our training, or the reason that we were there was to meet their line of objective or their security cooperation goals. And so blending that message so that it actually can highlight what we've done from a medical perspective and what we're doing for a line perspective is actually very beneficial because ultimately 
if our line officers look at us as people who are able to, um, um, you know, generate, you know, a, you know, a, a good story or, or generate a little bit of, of common good, but they don't see us as a part of their toolkit for meeting their security cooperation objectives, we're not going to get quite as far as we could get. Um, and so uh, that, that messaging can be pretty important. Um, what, five? Did you put that up five minutes ago, or? Right now. Right now, okay. <laughs> so I have five minutes and way too many slides. So what I'm going to do real quick here is um, go through some of the different ends, ways, and means that are out there, just so you have a, a sense for uh, for some of the things that are available to you to help you. Um, going back to to the, to the colonel's introduction, so you'll have these slides hopefully, and it has just a bunch of different organizations on it. Some of which don't really have a, a strong global health portion to it, but some do. So up in the DOD organizations and agencies that are there, there are people that, in all of these different areas that focus on, um, the, on global health. But typically there's only one or two people in those offices, and typically they're involved in policy, and at your level probably are not super beneficial um, as you go through this week's activities and even next year's activities. Obviously, DITRA talked to us yesterday, and they're an important arm, and it can be leveraged really well. Um, the National Center for Medical Intelligence falls under the Defense Intelligence Agency, and although they don't have global health engagement as a primary duty, much of what you do has to do with supporting force health protection, and they certainly uh, are, have an arm in that. Um, you, you, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency both does some funding and some guidance that you can um, take a look at. Uh, for example, APREP was kind of a, a DSCA um, uh, activity. Then at the Defense Health Agency, there are a couple areas that, that might be able to help. So there is the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Branch and the um, Global Emerging Infections um, um, uh, System that are part of the, that, um, uh, that organization. Those actually um, sometimes fund activities that are research-based but they can actually blend in with what you're doing, so you can add a research arm to what you're doing, whether it's research on us and our folks that are going downrange, or whether it's research on a disease process that we could partner with our um, colleagues on. I know the Kenyans do this quite often with our overseas labs down there. Um, there's, uh, at the Uniform Services University, there's a Center for Global Health Engagement, um, which um, has some people to uh, help with education and training. They were here a little while ago and put on the fundamentals of global health engagement course, but they also um, have some other capabilities, including some support uh, assessment and monitoring that you had uh, brought up yesterday. Uh, Demertai is part of that. They don't do very much internationally. They used to do a little bit that way, but um, they don't have a big international arm. The joint trauma system is a good reach back when you're looking for surgical things. Um, you don't have to reach all the way back to, um, uh, to San Antonio for that, because up at Launch Tool, um, you've got a, a great trauma surgeon up there who can um, who can hook up, and she's actually here um, this week. Um, I won't even mention much about the state partnership program because you guys are all over that and really and really understand it. Um, and then just keep in mind that in addition to all of the things that you have in the Army that you're well aware of, there are some things in the Navy that you can potentially draw in on. There are some things in the Air Force that you could potentially draw on. And depending on what you're doing, those could be nice add-ons. We don't often do that. I know when I was doing Air Force missions, it was oftentimes, unfortunately, an afterthought to bring in the right person from the Army. You know, even if we were doing medical evacuation and we're with, working with a nation that only has rotary assets, that's not our bailiwick, that's yours. You know, should have had Army people coming along on those missions. And there could be the same issue that comes up with you. So think about your sister services when you're putting things together. It's a real pain to um, get authorization for them and to get those personnel assigned, but that's a great idea. So I am over my time, I guess. No? You got an extra three minutes. Oh, you, oh. oh, so this is like this is like soccer, and, uh, and there were some penalties earlier, and I've got a three-minute reprieve. Okay. Well, then first thing I want to do is apologize to the interpreters for talking as fast as I was just talking. I, I keep forgetting that they're helping us. And so I hope that I, I, I apologize for that. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, I think there are some risks that we just need to kind of keep in mind when we go through these long-term strategies. Certainly, fundings can change, personnel can change. Uh, we have real-world events that stop what we're doing. Um, but if we've actually put our strategy together properly, 
Um, those things will be, you know, they will be obstacles and they will modify things for us, but they won't derail us completely. Whereas if we don't have a long-term strategy, if we stick with a, what are we doing next year, what are we doing, you know, uh, immediately, then when these things come along, we have to do a complete reset after they happen to kind of get back on track. And so keep in mind that although you have all these challenges, they're not necessarily um, things that should keep you from having, uh, having your strategy be successful. Um, there are lots of different examples out there of strategy. You know, this is one from Southcom for one of their um, activities called Resolute Sentinel. And it talks about, you know, here are the means that we're going to do, here are the ways we're going to do it, and here's what we're trying to accomplish at the end. And having something like this, which I know most of you do for your activities, is very helpful, especially when you're talking to your line commanders, because it gives them an, an understanding of why you're, why you're actually doing there and why they should fund you and support you to go there. And the other thing to keep in mind is, again, trying to make these strategies long term. So this is one from Arsent from a few years ago. And, um, and so it talks about you know, what are the lines of effort that they're trying to accomplish. And then in each out year, what types of activities do they hope to be able to do to meet those, um, to meet those uh, lines of effort and the ultimate objectives that they have. And so that's obviously what you guys are going to be working on in your small groups. And you may not be taking it out five years tomorrow because you've only got a, a day to work on this. Um, but if you can get the lines of effort established that you're looking for, that's a huge win. And if you can get the first uh, you know, a year or two um, put in there, then it, can, then it comes back to the team that remains behind here at um, CTAF or you know, in combination with AFRICOM to actually fill out some of the subsequent years. And remember again that it doesn't have to be activities that you do only. You could put in here an activity that you think that you'd like to have the Navy accomplish, or you can put in something you want DEMO to do. So your activities that meet those lines of objectives you don't have to be only the activity that you're gonna be involved in. And oftentimes that's better for the host nation from a standpoint of helping them with their capacity development, but oftentimes it's better for us from a standpoint of ops tempo and the ability to actually um, accomplish a strategy and re-engage. So maybe you aren't with somebody one year um, you're, you're coming back the following year on an activity, but it's still part of a build from what you did two years previously. And so try to keep those kind of things in mind. So I have not left any time for um, questions, um, <laughs> but uh, um, how do you want to handle that? Just have them find me on a break? Yes, and, all right. Thank you. So find me on a break. <laughs> Thanks.